Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. I'm Zach Peterson. I'm a technical consultant with Altium. And today we're gonna to continue our discussion of differential pairs because in the previous videos, we've talked a little bit about some of the fundamental ideas behind differential signals and differential pairs. Now today, we're gonna to look at some more of the practical implementation of differential pairs and some of the rules that you can actually break with differential pairs. So let's go ahead and get started because we got a lot to go over. We originally were talking about differential pairs. There are a few fundamental concepts that we have to think about when we're routing differential pairs and when we're working with differential signals. Previously, when I had uh, done the video on differential pair routing, we initially had to talk about things like length matching. So keeping each side of the pair at a consistent length. We also had the equal and opposite polarity of the two signals. And this gives us some noise cancellation. And this is actually specified in the data sheet for a differential receiver as the common mode reduction ratio, usually uh, specified in dB. So a good uh, differential receiver or a differential interface on a typical device will have pretty high value for CMRR. The other thing that we talked about was impedance. These are the three pretty fundamental things about differential pairs that you have to specify in your design. And so, what we talked about last time was we said that they have to be exact. Well, the truth is that you actually have some leeway on differential pair length matching. They don't have to be exactly the same length. There is actually, if you look at the signaling standard specifications, there is a little bit of room to leave these things mismatched. But what they do in the signaling standards is they specify this in terms of time, not in terms of distance. So pay attention to that. So you can actually relax your requirements on length matching quite a bit, depending on the mismatch in time. So if you know the signal velocity and you know the time mismatch, you can then calculate the allowed length mismatch. So the reason that everybody says, well, you know, you need to keep your differential pairs perfectly length matched and all of this is because, well, frankly, modern CAD tools make it really easy to do that. So if you're using routing tools in something like Altium Designer, even something that doesn't really support differential pair routing, you can still do it really easily. They make it really easy to just length match everything. So guess what? Just go ahead and length match stuff. Next, the equal and opposite polarity is what gives us common mode noise reduction. It is often said that because of this, differential pairs are immune to crosstalk. That's not really true. First of all, if they were immune to crosstalk, your common mode reduction ratio would be negative infinity decibels, meaning you would never have any common mode noise. The fact is you can never perfectly cancel all common mode noise, but you can get pretty close. So that equal and opposite polarity does give you some level of crosstalk suppression, but it's not perfect. We'll look at uh, uh, the reason why here when I actually show an example layout. Then the impedance. So this is a fun one because it relates to two points that we talked about in the previous video on setting up differential pairs and designing traces to support differential signals. The first thing that we had was the width of each trace. And really, if you look at some of the earlier videos where we've talked about impedance, it's the width to height or substrate thickness ratio. So it's this ratio that determines the impedance of a single trace. Then we had the spacing. So the spacing between the pairs determines the differential impedance. So it determines how tightly these two pair, uh, these two traces are coupled together. It determines their mutual inductance and their mutual capacitance. And that will determine the spacing that you need to hit a particular impedance, particular differential impedance. So here for single ended, here for differential. Now, one thing that you'll see in a lot of guidelines is you'll hear somebody say something to the effect of, oh, if you're routing differential pairs, they always need to be tightly coupled. So what exactly does that mean? Frankly, whenever someone says tightly coupled, they never attach a number to it. If you're gonna say that you have to tightly couple something, you should actually define what that means. And unfortunately, nobody ever does. There is a reason to put pairs close together and we'll look at that here in just a moment, but you don't need to always have them routing right next to each other. They do need to have a defined spacing if you're aiming for a differential or for a target differential impedance, but they don't need to be overly close to each other because as we saw in one of the previous videos, if you get them too close to each other, you could violate your differential impedance target because the coupling between them gets too strong. So this goes a bit counter to some of the conventional wisdom that's out there about differential pair routing. You don't actually have to have them super close to each other over the entire length of the route. 
And so we'll see why here in just a moment. So why exactly do we have these issues with, uh, or this uh, ability to violate length matching just a little bit based on the allowed time mismatch in the receiver? So the reason has to do with termination and the way a differential receiver actually reads out a signal. Termination applied to differential pairs is actually different than termination as applied to a single-ended signal. So single-ended signal termination is generally a shunt element or a shunt impedance back to ground. The idea is that in termination, you apply source impedance to be the same as the trace impedance, to be the same as the input impedance at the receiver. And so with a single-ended pair, if I put an impedance going to ground that matches the trace impedance, then I've perfectly matched the impedances. What you'll actually see, even if you like look on Wikipedia or you look on a lot of design guides, is that the termination that gets applied for a differential pair is kind of the analog of, of what you see with the single-ended uh, signal. So what they'll do is they'll just put a resistor across the two pairs. That only works in a certain case. So what I wanna do now is look at exactly why that affects the signals, and then we'll look at how differential pairs are actually terminated in general. So what I've drawn here is a typical diagram for a differential pair being routed between two buffers, okay? So we have our input side, here's our buffer, here's our two lines that make up our differential pair. Here's the receiver, and then we have our output. On the top, I've got my plus signal, uh, or my positive polarity signal. If I draw it out, it's you know roughly something like this. Here on the bottom, I've got my negative polarity signal. If I draw it out, it's ideally, it's roughly something like this. And then here, we have our characteristic impedance of an individual trace. For most signaling standards, you know, 50 ohms. Same thing down here, 50 ohms. And then here at the buffer, at the input buffer, or at the input of the, uh, the receiver side, what do we do then to make sure that this is all impedance matched? Well, again, if you look at uh, Wikipedia, you look at, uh, you look at a lot of other design guidelines, what they'll actually draw is something like this, where they have a resistor running in parallel to these two lines. And then they'll set this to be like 100 ohms. So this was the original implementation of termination in differential pairs when they were first being used for differential signals over long links. This 100 ohms being used here essentially matches these two things in series. That's one way to think about it. But really what you're doing is you're matching this to the hypothetical differential impedance between these two lines. So. Just to go a little further, let's say that these were a bit closely spaced together, and instead of this being you know, 100 ohms differential impedance, let's say that ZD was 90 ohms. Well then, the parallel termination style that this, this whole thing talks about wouldn't be 100 ohms here, it would also be 90 ohms or whatever it needs to be to match the differential impedance with the receiver's input impedance. So that's the original way that this was done. What actually happens inside the buffer is you don't have just this one resistor, you actually have two resistors matched to the characteristic impedance, so here 50 ohms and 50 ohms, and then here we have this connected back to some reference voltage, okay? So we're just gonna call this VREF. And on some diagrams, you'll actually see a little capacitor here. What's important to note here is that this is what allows common mode noise reduction to happen, and it's what allows the pair, or the pair of signals, I should say, to be read out properly once it reaches the buffer. It's the fact that you have this VREF here. Now, this is equivalent to the case where I have a single resistor routed all the way across here without this reference voltage when these two things are perfectly matched. So there's nothing wrong with length matching everything. And like I said, CAD tools make it super easy to do, you might as well just do it. An important thing to remember about this whole circuit with termination is if you have on-die termination for your interface or for your component, you don't need to actually build this. I think it's easy to look at some of these diagrams and think, oh, I have to actually build out this circuit that's at the receiver. That's not necessarily the case, okay? So make sure to check your data sheets for your components. It'll tell you if you need termination or if on-die termination is already applied. So as we were uh, going through and editing this video, um, I found some other examples and some components that use uh, different types of differential pair termination. Um, so we definitely wanna talk about those. So on the left, this is the kind of the textbook standard uh, differential differential pair termination scheme that you'll see. Um, you don't normally see these capacitors here drawn in the actual uh, diagram for this. Um, they're 
included in the buffer, but you know your data sheet might recommend placing these capacitors here for whatever reason. Um, here on the right, this is split termination. Um, so that's the uh, the formal name for this termination scheme. Um, and you see this capacitor back to ground. Um, this is similar to what's used in Ethernet. Just with Ethernet, they do it off the back of a transformer. Um, so in looking at this, uh, you can actually find similar stuff if you look in data sheets for uh, for other components. So let me just go over here. You know, if you look at the uh, the uh, Wikipedia page for differential signaling, you'll see that they show the uh, the standard hundred ohm termination resistor here across the uh, across the inputs of the receiver. Um, however, if you look at some actual components, you may not find that that's the case. So let's just look at an example here from a Texas Instruments component. So this component is a uh, differential. It's a set of differential line drivers and receivers. Texas Instruments will do this sometimes. They'll they'll lump the entire uh, set of components into a single data sheet because they're they're meant to work together, um, which is fine. Um, and you know, this is reasonably high data rates. I mean, considering today we're in the multi gigabit range uh, per second, but you know, these are reasonably high data rates. But just just for context, whenever you're looking at data sheets, take a look at the date. This is originally put out July 1999. However, the component's been very successful. It was revised 2014. And then if I just open up this product page really quick, you'll see that this is still in active production. So um, this is not like an obsolete component. This is still something that is that is definitely used. And so if you look through the initial set of uh, specifications here on the left, what do you see? You'll see here, receiver includes line termination. So the receiver includes this 100 ohm resistor across the inputs. And if you scroll down to the package view, take a look at the receiver component, here, here they have 110 ohm. Uh, scroll down here. Here they have 110 ohm. I don't know why they have 110 ohm listed here, but that's okay. Um, but they have the resistor across the inputs. So let's look at this Intel FPGA. So this particular FPGA um, includes a variety of on-die termination schemes. Um, and if you try and search for on-die termination, you won't actually find any of it because they use the term on chip termination. So just be mindful of that. Um, but it does include a number of on chip termination schemes. And actually on the product page, if I just scroll down here for their design guidelines, by the way, their design guidelines are advocating you do something really bad, which is to put this ferrite bead on the VCC bus with a capacitor to try and filter out high frequency noise from the power delivery network. Do not do this. This is bad. This adds impedance to the power delivery network. It increases noise on the power bus and it could cause your chip to fail or to have very noisy outputs on the on the IOs. So do not do this. I know you're going to say, hey, man, this is Intel. They're supposed to know what they're doing. Well, they're great at making chips, but whoever wrote these design guidelines did not do a good job because they're advocating something here that you should not do. So let's get back to termination here. If I just kind of scroll down, um, there's one figure in here. Actually, there's several figures in here. So here's all the different termination schemes that they support with their different um, the different logic uh, standards that uh, you can implement on this FPGA. Um, and then here is the on-chip termination for uh, for a differential pair. Uh, so here you can see for uh, one of the logic families that they support, and you can find out which one it is in the data sheet, that they have on-chip termination both on the output side and on the input side. And then they're using pull-up resistors to this uh, to this reference voltage. Okay, so in all of these cases where we have this pull-up resistor or going back over here to this split termination scheme, in all these cases, they set a reference so that you can provide a consistent level for a uh, common mode voltage that you want to filter out from these uh, from this differential pair. So that's the reason that they do this. And if you go in here to the to the data sheet just for this Intel Stratix FPGA. Just go down to the termination schemes. Um, this is all this all of this is selectable depending on which uh, 
depending on which uh, of these different standards you want to implement as your I.O. standard on the, on the device. Um, so Intel's FPGAs are really nice because they, they do allow you to do this. I don't use FPGAs so much. You know, we do a lot more with microcontrollers um, or possibly an MPU. Um, but FPGAs are pretty cool because they give you this kind of flexibility. Okay, so that's all I got for this. Let's get back to the video. So now let's talk about the case of crosstalk and the supposed immunity to crosstalk for differential pairs. So as I mentioned earlier, differential pairs are not necessarily automatically immune to all crosstalk. Like I said, if the common mode noise reduction ratio was negative infinity decibels, then you would have perfect crosstalk cancellation or common mode noise cancellation, but it's not. You can never get there. You can get pretty high levels of common mode noise reduction in most components. So. There will be a spec in your data sheets for your processor or for whatever component you're using that has a differential interface, and it'll tell you what that spec is. Now, the reason that you generally don't ever have perfect crosstalk cancellation is not because the receiver can't do it. It's actually because if you look at a PCB and then you look at how fields are generated from a PCB, what you'll find is that it's impossible to receive perfectly equal amounts of noise on each pair due to inductive crosstalk and due to capacitive crosstalk. I'm showing here a side view or I guess a frontal view. Let's say here is a trace and let's just say for a moment this is a single-ended trace. This is going to be my aggressor trace. Okay, so when we talk about crosstalk, we have an aggressor trace and then we have some other trace which is a victim. And then let's say we have two more traces over here and these are part of a differential pair. Why can't we ever get perfect crosstalk received by this trace and by this trace? So remember, if you ever wanna have perfect crosstalk or perfect common mode noise cancellation in a differential pair, you need to receive the exact same amount of signal on each pair. So you won't get actual perfect crosstalk cancellation. You'll get pretty close because the common mode noise reduction does a good job. And if these are close enough to the aggressor and close enough to each other, you will get similar amounts, and, and when I say similar, I mean order of magnitude, amounts of crosstalk induced on each signal. So let's just say that this is our ground plane for the moment. We have this being routed over a ground plane. And around this trace, we have some magnetic field lines. So let's say that the current is flowing out of the page, the magnetic field is generated around the trace. So just from the right hand rule from your uh, from your electronics classes, okay? So eventually some of these field lines will actually intersect this current loop for this trace above the ground plane. And then there will be some other line that intersects this current loop for this trace above the ground plane. Now the strength of these two field lines goes down with increased distance. And so what that means is that because this trace is farther away from the aggressor, you would expect that the noise induced here is gonna be smaller. So here we might have larger noise, and here we might have smaller noise. Here, you receive some crosstalk. It's, it might not be perfectly canceled at the receiver. So what that means is that you can't just take one of these, you can't take this aggressor trace and just route it right up next to these other two traces in the differential pair. If you do that, you might have a problem with excessive crosstalk into these two pairs, and you don't have any guarantee that the crosstalk is actually gonna be perfectly canceled. The remedy here is to just move this aggressor away from these other traces. Sometimes you'll see some guidelines that say, oh, well, you know, if I run some ground vias right here, I run some ground vias around this aggressor trace, I can shield it or, you know, I can, I can uh, provide some isolation. And I mean, yes, it does block the electric field or it causes the electric field to terminate, at these ground vias. So let's say we you know, put some ground vias right here and right here. And yeah, it does block some of the field lines. The, the problem is that it can also modify the impedance of one of these traces because it creates some parasitic capacitance. So there would be some capacitance right here. So when there's a signal traveling along here, I might have my signal with some waveform like this. Here when we're at high potential, if this via is at ground, we've now basically just created a capacitor right here. And that capacitance modifies the impedance of this trace just a little bit. Again, the, the best solution in any case is to just take this aggressor, move it a little bit further away. Last but not least, skew allowances. So first, what is skew? I think it's easiest to talk about skew by looking at our positive waveform and then our 
negative waveform. And here I've got my negative waveform, I've got my positive waveform up here. Now skew is essentially whatever little time difference here might exist between these edges. Let's just say that uh, instead of the waveform being right there, it's delayed just a little bit and it's right here. So this distance right here, from right here to right here, this is my skew, okay? And it's a value in time. So differential receivers can withstand some skew. It's really the signaling standard that specifies the limit on skew. So that skew limitation can be pretty generous for some differential signals. So with USB 2.0, just as an example, that's about 100 picoseconds of skew. 100 picoseconds of skew, I mean, is that a lot? Is that a little bit? Well, like I said earlier, you wanna take this and convert it into a length, and that's gonna give you your length matching tolerance for your differential pairs when you're actually doing your routing. To convert this to a length, what you could actually do is just use an approximate velocity for the signal, and that'll give you an idea of what your uh, length mismatch can be. So for that, you need to know the dielectric constant of your substrate. You need to know the actual signal propagation velocity. That's gonna be different if you're on a, a microstrip on the surface layer or if you're doing a strip line because on the microstrip you have an effective dielectric constant, but you can get that from your uh, stack up calculator. If you're using an application like Polar or Saturn, they'll give it to you. If you're using Altium Designer Stack Up Manager, you'll actually see it returned with some of the simulation results that it gives for, uh, for the impedance solver. So that'll give you the propagation delay and you can use that to figure out what your length matching tolerance should be. So let's just continue with this for just a moment. I'm just gonna use uh, like a microstrip uh, trace for example, okay? So for a microstrip trace, the propagation delay is somewhere in the neighborhood of like 150 picoseconds per inch. So 150 picoseconds per inch, you invert that, that's about six inches per nanosecond. With a picosecond, or 100 picoseconds I should say, being a tenth of a nanosecond, then if this is our allowed skew for this interface, then our Length mismatch, let's just call it delta L, is gonna be about 0.6 inches. So 0.6 inches, that's 600 mils. So 600 mils, that's pretty generous, especially when you consider what modern CAD tools can do with routing. You can actually get within like a fraction of a mil if you really wanted to with length matching on each side of a, of a differential pair. Now, as you go to faster and faster interfaces, these numbers are gonna go down, so, I mean, the number for skew is gonna go down. So is delta L. Your length, uh, your length mismatch tolerance is also going to go down. So again, they don't have to be exactly perfect. CAD tools make it easy to get pretty close. If you do apply length matching to get underneath this skew tolerance and get beneath this length tolerance, you want to apply it at the driver side, not at the receiver side. At the receiver side, you generally want to keep them linked and route directly into the receiver. At the driver side or where the actual mismatch occurs is always a good place to apply that length matching structure. One of the things that's sometimes said about differential pairs is that they emit no noise, and that's not exactly true. They do emit noise, it's just that it can be low enough that you might not notice it. They do actually create crosstalk, so differential pairs can create crosstalk in other differential pairs, and that's called differential crosstalk. So we have an article that we'll put in the link in the description. That article that I did uh, for Altium is actually deriving some of the concepts from someone named Doug Brooks, he used to work at a company called UltraCAD. Go ahead and take a look at that article. I've got a reference in there that goes back to Doug's original paper, and you can learn a lot more about differential crosstalk from there. As far as the noise from a differential pair, let's just take a look again at our PCB. And I'm just gonna draw our two traces on the top layer. When I have this one being the plus polarity, this one being the minus polarity, I've got current, let's say it's coming out of the page, so my magnetic field lines are gonna be like this. Here, current's going in the opposite direction, or I've got the opposite polarity. And so my field lines go like this. And so as you extend this out and draw farther and farther field lines away from the traces, what happens is you'll notice here I have vectors pointing this direction and then I have vectors pointing the opposite direction over here. So these two noise sources, because they do emit some radiation when I have a signal propagating on them, the two sources of radiation 
are pointing in opposite directions, or their magnetic fields are. And we can draw something similar for the electric fields, okay? The electric fields will also be pointing in the opposite direction over here in this, in this region and in this region away from the trace. So that's important because this shows how having these two traces routing with opposite polarity actually brings down the amount of noise that they emit. So this is differential mode noise, and it's not that it's exactly zero. In fact, in order for it to be exactly zero, the traces would have to be right on top of each other. So the closer they are together, you do get more noise reduction because the distance between these two contours starts to decrease. As the, the distance between these contours starts to decrease, these two vectors more closely align. If they have equal magnitude, opposite polarity, guess what? They will cancel perfectly. Due to this distance between these two contours, they don't cancel out perfectly, but they get pretty close. So this differential mode noise is somewhere on the order of about 100x smaller than common mode noise. So if we had any common mode noise being routed on this trace and this trace, common mode noise that gets radiated is actually much stronger. Again, not perfect noise cancelers, and it's not that they don't emit any noise, but they do emit a lot less than common mode noise, especially common mode noise in high current systems like power systems. Common mode noise is a big problem in power systems. You have to do what you can to eliminate it. With differential pairs, you're not gonna have that same problem with noise emission because that noise is in the differential mode. So hopefully this clears up some of the misconceptions that sometimes arise around differential pairs. And sometimes they are seen as a cure-all for signal integrity problems. They can experience their own set of signal integrity problems as we've outlined here. So just to reiterate, Length matching happens within some tolerance, doesn't have to be perfect. Crosstalk, they don't perfectly cancel crosstalk. You can usually get close. Same thing with common mode noise. And then termination, it's not as simple as just a 100 ohm resistor placed across the two pairs. Pay attention to your data sheets for on-die termination. And last but not least, noise emission. It's differential mode emission. It's actually a lot smaller than common mode noise emission, so you might not notice it compared to other noise sources. If you want the best set of routing and layout tools, go check out a free trial of Altium Designer. There's a link in the description. You can download, try it for free, play around with the routing tools and see if you like it. Thanks for watching. Give us a like, give us a subscribe, and uh, don't forget to call your fabricator.